Hello, and welcome to the Interstitial Cystitis Association's Living Well with IC BPS Results of the IC HOPE Study webinar. My name is Lee Lowry, and I am the Executive Director of the Interstitial Cystitis Association. Thank you so much for joining us today. Also known as the ICA, we are the only nonprofit charitable organization dedicated solely to improving the quality of healthcare and lives of people living with interstitial cystitis. The ICA provides great resources year round. Our magazine, the ICA Update, is published three times per year and is a benefit for donors who give $50 or more annually. We also archive back issues on the website and provide access to these donors. And here are some other great resources that the ICA is able to provide for free to the ICBPS community through the generous support of our donors. We have the ICA e-news, which is our free bi-weekly electronic newsletter, our website, uh, www.ichelp.org which has a wealth of free information and tools, including the ICA Healthcare Provider Registry and IC Support Group listings. We have our Facebook, sort, excuse me, Facebook support group for the IC BPS community. And it's an engaged group of over 2,800 users who are looking for a place to connect with others who are living with the disease as well as their loved ones. And we have ICA's online support community, which is a safe peer-to-peer moderated forum that currently connects more than 25,000 people experiencing similar symptoms, situations, and experiences. And you can find ICA on all of the major social media channels. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar featuring ICA board member and, um, uh, sorry, ICA board member, Dr. Laura Santori. Uh, Lori, I'm gonna, Turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm currently a faculty member at the University of Indianapolis in the College of Health Sciences, and I have a formal background in health promotion with a very specific interest in the management of chronic disease and very specifically very interested in chronic conditions that involve pain. Um, IC is a cause that is near and dear to my heart. I've been living with the condition for almost 25 years, um, and I know and care about many people with this condition. I've worked with the IC, ICA since almost the time of my diagnosis, uh, but most recently I was elected to be vice chair of the board and looking forward to assuming the chair position next year. We're going to begin the presentation, which was pre-recorded, um, but after that we will have a live Q&A session um, during the presentation, please feel free to begin placing questions in the Q&A portion of Zoom. Um, you can go ahead and put those in there and I'll do the best that I can to answer your questions after the recording of the presentation. Um, I certainly won't be able to answer questions about specific medical treatment or personal treatments, um, but certainly would be very happy to talk about the study and some of the results and the concepts that came up um, in the presentation. So without further ado, I, we were going to go ahead and um, start the, the recording. The intent of this presentation is to highlight the results of a study that I conducted back in 2019. And I like to begin with gratitude always, and as, as often the case, there are many people involved in this work who are deserving of thanks. First, I want to thank those who participated in the study, who chose to share their experiences with my team. I would like to thank my team, Dr. Moore, who is a colleague at the University of Indianapolis in the College of Health Sciences, and Nicolette Schlupp, an undergraduate student at my institution in public health. I want to thank my university for funding the study. I'm incredibly grateful to the ICA for helping with recruitment and certainly for facilitating this webinar today. And a special shout out to my research mentor, someone who I've known for well over 20 years now, Dr. Buffington, who is instrumental in helping me prepare this webinar today. So let me start with a bit of an introduction. You are going to hear me say I see throughout this presentation, but please know that I am not trying to exclude anyone because we do know that multiple terms are used to refer to folks who have this condition. So um, we, we say bladder pain syndrome or painful bladder syndrome, um, but I will say IC just to be um, to abbreviate it and for the purposes of time. So I would 
I would imagine that many people on this webinar today have a good sense of what IC is, but I'll just talk about it briefly um, in a very kind of straightforward way. Symptoms often mimic those of a urinary tract infection, but obviously with no infection present. With pain often, but not always, one of the most impactful symptoms. Um, certainly folks also experience um, issues of urinary urgency and frequency as well, but symptoms do vary from individual to individual. So speaking of chronic pain, in 2018, the CDC estimated uh, approximately 50 million adults in the United States are affected by this. And it, more specifically, IC is known to be one of a, um, one of a variety of conditions that are starting to be referred to as chronic overlapping pain conditions. Um, there's a growing body of literature on these conditions. It includes things like irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, endometriosis, vulvodynia, among a number of others. And what that literature presents is that these are really complex conditions, um, especially when it comes to understanding what causes them. How they present is diverse, so they, the symptoms vary uh, and the mix of symptoms vary from individual to individual. And it's really hard to estimate how many people have these uh, conditions um, given issues of comorbidity. That is, a lot of folks who have one often have another or multiple. But what we know, depending on what study you look at, there's kind of a, an estimated range of people in the US who have IC, and that's about four to 12 million. So let's talk a little more about IC. So what's the, what's the bad news? Um, so we do know that we, we don't know what causes it, um, although there are a variety of hypotheses and there are probably multiple factors involved, but we don't know what specifically causes this condition. And because of that, the diagnosis is one of exclusion, which means you have to rule other things out before you make the diagnosis. And unfortunately, there are no treatments uh, specifically kind of traditional biomedical treatments that are known to be effective in the majority of patients. And as, a, again, I would guess a number of people know on this webinar today, living with this condition can have um, a variety of impacts on daily life. Anything from your ability to sleep, to go to work, to recreate, to have fun, uh, certainly can have an impact on relationships um, and, and certainly in relation to physical intimacy. Um, so we know that there are a variety of challenges of living with this condition. Interestingly, though, a more recent study in 2019 found that um, after following I think, a couple hundred patients that they recruited um, and following them for about 16 to 17 years, one of the things that they found was that about half of those folks got better with or without regular medical follow-up or engaging in new treatment strategies, which is at a minimum really thought-provoking. So, what was the intent of my study? So when I looked at the literature, as I noted, there's a whole bunch of literature about how challenging this condition can, can be. But I thought there was a gap because there really isn't any literature out there about people who are doing well. And that does not mean at all that I don't care about people who aren't doing well, but I just found that to be a bit of a gap in what we know. And so the intent of my study was to identify people living with this condition who are doing fairly well um, so average to above average physical and mental health, and to learn about how they cope with the condition. So the approach that I use, so any study that collects information from people really needs to be reviewed and approved to ensure the ethical treatment of both the participants and the information that they share. And so the IRB at my institution was the organization or, or entity that did that for me. Then we identified participants via an online survey. Um, so the ICA um, graciously agreed to send out a link to my survey asking their patient community to participate. And on that survey, we asked questions about physical and mental health, uh, perceptions of um, how much pain interferes with their daily life. We asked about their symptoms. We also asked about sexual satisfaction and interest. Um, and I won't go into that data in detail um, in this webinar, although certainly feel free to ask me questions about this. Um, but I included those measures because I really feel like that's an area that needs to be discussed more when it comes to this patient population, because I think it's a way, if we address it more clearly, to improve patient outcomes. So then we invited individuals who scored a particular way in physical and mental health for a second we call qualitative phase of the study. And we call this a, a, we call it a case study approach. And essentially what that means is we're collecting multiple types of data on one person. So in addition to the survey data that people provided initially, we also asked them to participate in an interview with me, 
They did some journaling that had a photography component, so they provided pictures. And then we also did group debriefs. So after we collected all of that data, it was an awful lot, um, what we did is we reviewed it to one kind of look at, kind of compare and contrast it between um, individuals who participated, and most importantly, to identify um, overarching or common themes in that data. So when it comes to the survey, so we, we had 541 usable survey responses. And then we recruited nine participants for the qualitative study. And I think it's important to note with qualitative studies that it's very normal to have a much smaller sample size because the data that you are collecting is much different. The intent of the study is much different. So I wanna tell you a little bit about people who participated in the study. And I wanna start with their physical and mental health scores because I think this is really important. So the way that we collected data on physical and mental health allows us to compare our participants to the general population when it comes to physical and mental health. So what we did is we, um, we asked ser a series of questions about physical and mental health. We um, assigned a number to all their responses and each person got a score, a number. And what we can do because of the nature of how we measured this is we can, we can take each person's raw score and convert it to something called a T-score. And I promise you, I'm not gonna get into the weeds of the statistics here, but that T-score allows us to compare people. So um, if you look at this bell curve, if you're familiar with the, the bell curve, um, a, a, a score, an average score of 50 is right down the middle of that. And if you look at our scores, um, our folks had uh, about average, so median of 50.3 or 50.9, um, even with some room above and below that, still considered average. You can see that the people who participated in our qualitative study were about about the same as the general population. Another way of looking at this, so just another visual here. So if you look at um, the, the, the data on the right of this chart here for the study, that's the um, versus the what's on the left for the survey. So again, comparing um, 541 folks who completed the survey to our nine participants in the study, what you're going to see is that um, the folks who completed the survey um, generally had less than average um, physical and mental health as compared to the general population. But the people who participated in our study were much more similar to the general population. So doing better perhaps than others who, who had completed the survey. So, um, so we think we did what we intended to do, which was to identify people who are about average when it comes to physical and mental health. So looking at, um, again, some additional data on folks who participated. So um, our, our nine individuals in the qualitative study were uh, mostly middle-aged, um, were mostly female, and uh, mostly white and non-Hispanic. Most were married or in a relationship and also had some formal education post high school. Most were working either full or part time and average length of time with the condition was about seven years, but you can see there was quite a range anywhere from one to 30 years. This does not equate to time with or since diagnosis because sometimes there is a lag between symptom onset and time of diagnosis, but I wanted to focus more on how long someone had been living with a condition. So before I get into the qualitative data, so all the, the, the narrative, the story, the images that people shared, I wanna situate our results because even though we approached the data in a very open way without preconceived notions about what we were going to find, we, we did quickly see a pattern developing here. So I grew up, I don't know about you, but I grew up with a very traditional, we call biomedical approach to um, looking at illness and injury. So the idea in my head was, hey, if I have a symptom like pain, it's associated with some sort of physical damage. Um, something is broken or there's some inflammation in the tissue. And if you treat that damage, the symptoms will go away. So for example, you know, this, this works really well with like a broken arm and a variety of other health issues, uh, many other health issues, although arguably maybe not as many as we think. There's an alternate kind of way of thinking about this. And that is what you see in front of you, which is the biopsychosocial approach. And with this approach, we recognize that some health conditions are really complex. And as of yet, we really can't understand what that quote unquote damage is. Um, that may not be the best word for it, but it's the easiest way for me to kind of think about it. It does not mean 
that conditions are in people's heads, that they're making them up, that they're not real. That is absolutely not what this, this approach says. It just means that some conditions are more complex and may be produced or made worse or better by factors that aren't strictly biological. So how we choose to cope, the emotions we experience or express, our relationships with others, those things matter when it comes to coping, especially with chronic disease. These factors have an ability to affect outcomes. So another way of looking at this, um, in 2018, a group of authors looked at all the liter well, a lot of the literature on coping with chronic disease, and they came up with a model to explain the, those factors that seem to influence coping. And it, it is very much another way of looking at this biopsych biopsychosocial approach. And it's an acronym called THRIVE, and it stands for a variety of factors that seem to a framework, uh, so to speak, about understanding how to cope with a chronic condition. And I'm going to talk about these in depth as I talk about my data, because I definitely, we definitely saw these in the information that people shared with us. Um, and so I'll talk about um, each of these. And some of these factors we call external, so things that are, you know, in somebody's environment or the people around them. And some of these are more internal, having to do with someone's, um, maybe their personality or how they think and feel about something. So I'm going to jump into the data. I do want to note that, um, again, this is it's text data, it's narrative data, it's um, images, that uh, uh, photographs that people took. Um, the data is de-identified, but there are some photos that are identifying, but I do want to make sure I say explicitly that consent has been provided to share those identifying photos. So we'll start with a look at those therapeutic interventions. And so what we're talking about here or any factors, anything that's provided by a healthcare practitioner. So one of the first things that we talked about with participants was the experience of initial diagnosis. And many people talked about how it was a bit of a process to really kind of, again, rule out other things to finally land on this particular name, this condition. Um, so this person is talking about, well, as a process of elimination, you might have interstitial cystitis, something that her provider had told her. Um, and they also said, you know, hey, it's just kind of something that we figure that you have once we've ruled out everything else. In addition to kind of this process of elimination, folks also talked about dealing with the complexity of having other conditions, um, but also issues of misdiagnosis. So this person was talking about, hey, I'd always been diagnosed with vulvodynia, and I would always get tested for all kinds of bladder infections, which I never had. Um, so this person just had to keep pushing and pushing and going and finding um, and seeking care from the, the medical community to finally get that diagnosis. And of course, you know, a lot of people talked about feeling relief at having a name for it, figuring out what it was, but also that initial reaction when you look it up and you learn more about it and realize that it's not well understood and there aren't really any known cures for this condition. And so folks definitely noted that, saying things like, I think it's, you know, I know I've got it for the rest of my life. I know that it's there. I hate to live with it and it's not going to go away. Uh, and, you know, another person said, I'm one of those people that gets on the internet, starts to read everything, you know, but it was initially very depressing because I learned, of course, there's no cure. And so that relief is kind of followed sometimes by almost a sense of grief and loss, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and to some extent, even a little bit of um, a shift in identity, who someone is. And another thing that was found, um, even though there were certainly kind of a spectrum of helpfulness from the providers that people engaged with, especially early on. Um, one of the themes that came out of their discussion about engaging with the healthcare community was that there were often, there was a feeling of a lack of aid or answers. Um, and, you know, talking about how providers, you know, didn't have all the answers and how sometimes the perception was that they were, the patients were being told, hey, we really don't do anything except for, you know, hey, go follow this diet. Um, so in some ways, feeling a little bit like there weren't answers and in some ways, almost feeling a little bit like they were being written off. Um, I really appreciate this image and the, the, the reflection about this. Um, for this person, this participant, the picture represents the shroud around knowledge surrounding IC. You know, even with doctors and healthcare professionals, information about IC can feel hidden behind the curtain that people are unaware or maybe even misinformed about the condition. 
talking about experiences with providers, um, I think there was a lot of discussion, of course, about this feeling of lack of aid, but also really valuing providers who were supportive, who spent time with the, with, with the patient. Um, even if they didn't have all the answers, they were willing to be, to be supportive in other ways. And so this person here is talking about, you know, one, acknowledging that lack of knowledge and the frustration, but wanting them, others to know that it's really important to have a doctor that is willing to put in the time and effort to learn, to do their own research, um, and, you know, saying, hey, we want people to support us. And we want to feel like even if our doctors don't know all the answers, they're willing to go look for them versus just writing us off. Um, you know, instead of saying, hey, go find somebody else. It's really important to have that kind of support and that willingness. Um, and others talked about providers who are willing to do that. Um, and also noting, uh, really appreciating providers who didn't provide judgment. So saying, I didn't feel like there was any judgment on symptoms I was experiencing. Whatever pain I was experiencing, I felt like he was always there to help. Um, he seemed to be at the forefront of studies, understand different treatment options, uh, willing to look at the individual and really trying to help you figure out what was going to be the best thing for you. So again, even, be, even with that lack of aid and answers, having providers who were supportive was really meaningful. And others did note more traditional biomedical treatments that have seemed to help. So this person talked a little bit about the InterStem, which is a medical device, um, and that it, you know, even though there was this initial kind of uh, frustration around several months of going into the office, getting it reprogrammed, trying to get the right settings, um, that it, once they got those right settings, it had been really great um, and really effective for them. Others talked about medications more generally. Um, this person noting, you know, I took a picture of this, these medications. Um, um, it's the result of many years of research. It makes me feel hopeful that through pharmaceutical, medical, and other research that during my lifetime, they will find out what causes I see and, and how to treat, treat the condition. Others noted um, other specific medications like antihistamines. So this individual talked a little bit about Benadryl. Um, hydroxyzine is another option. Um, they also noted, though, concerns around the literature that may have shown kind of an association between some of these antihistamines and dementia um, and, and having their experience kind of seeing that you know, Benadryl might be concerning because of that, um, but maybe they'd be willing to try it again um, if things flared up. Others also talked about physical therapy. Um, and noting uh, having those exercises, things that they can even do at home if they want to, but knowing that they've got this really wonderful physical therapist who, um, if they have a flare up, they can call her and she'll get me in within a couple of days and I'll go for another 10 sessions. So really finding some relief with that. So in summary about these therapeutic interventions, I think the things to note here are the diagnosis is indeed um, a process of illumination, excluding other things. And multiple people talked about issues of misdiagnosis and sometimes having to seek the perspectives of multiple providers before really landing on the firm diagnosis of IC. And as I noted, there was relief expressed in having a name, but also grief and a sense of loss in knowing that there wasn't a cure. And certainly the helpfulness of providers varied. Um, there certainly was a noted lack of aid and answers but there were also providers, even despite that, who were incredibly supportive and who people um, continually sought care from, and that there were some traditional biomedical treatments that brought some relief from symptoms. So let's talk about the H in the THRIVE acronym, habits and routines. So here we're talking about any behaviors that are undertaken to manage a condition. Um, and I think this one is really important. This was probably the most prominent theme and in the data. And it recognizes that patients are actively involved in their own care. They're not just passive recipients of instructions provided by healthcare practitioners. And one of the strongest things that I saw was that even when people sought care from a healthcare provider, um, you know, especially early on for the diagnosis, many did not continually um, or only in the case of, of a flare. And so here when I asked, hey, you know, the next question I'd ask you is what role do healthcare or medical providers play in the management of your condition? And this person summed it up pretty succinctly. They said, none. Um, a little more, more detail from other folks. So this person saying, you know, hey, nobody is managing my IC but me. And that's been for several years. I've just been going along and living with it. Um, I would say it's sort of like when everybody has a kid, everybody's going to give you their opinion, but you have to try different things and see what works for be best for you. So let me review some of the self-care strategies that folks talked about. 
So one, um, there were a couple of a variety of supplements that came up in what people shared. So this person talked a little bit about freeze dried aloe vera um, and, and having to take quite a bit of it, um, 12 capsules a day, um, and really sometimes feeling a little overwhelmed by the, the number of, of pills that they have to take, uh, a seemingly unsustainable amount to cope with icy pain. And this individual took a picture of holding all those capsules. And another thing to note here is the cost. Um, so a number of people talked about, even though this thing is helpful, cost is a challenge. You know, I didn't, I never anticipated I have to be paying, you know, almost $300 every month. It's hard to budget for. So this juxtaposition between finding something that helps, but recognizing the, the challenges of engaging in that self-care strategy. Others talked about um, other types of supplements, um, like uh, acid reducers. So it says this person says a calcium calcium type of tablet, taking acid away from food. Um, you can take a couple of them, and it'll reduce the dec decrease the acidity of in what you're eating or drinking. It's just it's not horribly expensive, but it's excellent. So this person noted um, specifically preleaf, which they put with um, a few different types of foods that they would normally need to take that preleaf with. Um, well, it certainly varies from individual to individual. Um, others talked about heat. So um, this person indicated a warm Epsom salt bath. Um, this is really something that they can do to manage the symptoms before they become overwhelming. Um, another people noted heat more generally, um, wanting to just jump into the shower, <laughs> um, just the heat of the water being a relief. But if that doesn't help, grabbing a heating pad um, to help kind of uh, relax muscles and numb the burning sensation. Uh, others talked about alleviating pressure. So um, pressure from, especially from clothing um, or where you're, how you're sitting. And so trying to alleviate pressure is a way to help. Um, some of the images I really appreciated uh, related to heat. So even just getting cozy with a blanket, um, even the heated seats uh, in the car or that, that trusty heating pad being helpful. Um, others uh, talked about hydration and, and making sure to drink water and some of the challenges between um, wanting to stay hydrated, but also if you drink a lot, that that can also cause some exacerbation and symptoms for, for some. And so, you know, coping with that frequency and urgency. And so this person says there's this fine balance of drinking liquids to keep your body at ease. Um, so, you know, again, being between drinking enough so that you don't have, um, as this person noted, an increase in symptoms when um, feeling like their, their urine was too concentrated, but also not wanting to be in the bathroom all the time. And so they shared um, images of, and a couple people shared images of the tools, uh, their mugs and flasks and all those things um, that, that help keep them hydrated. Others talked about physical activity, and this person shared a screenshot of an achievement for them, uh, going in for a, a one mile walk. Um, and so this person talked specifically about walking and cardio, um, feeling proud of it, you know, overcoming the obstacles between me and regular exercise, even light impact. And I think a lot of people talked about light impact exercise. And one of the things I loved when we did a group debrief, it, when we looked at this, this screenshot, another person shared, you know, somebody might look at that and think, gosh, they didn't get their 10,000 steps in. But then, you know, if you're living with a chronic illness and they manage over 3,300 steps, well, that's pretty great. And I think that was another piece of this, too, is kind of recognizing and meeting yourself where you are. Um, and for this individual, this was a really, this was a really big deal. Um, others talked about downhill skiing, cross-country skiing, going for walks. Yoga came up a bit, um, not only for kind of the physical benefits, but also the mental benefits here, talking about the incorporation of breathing and the stretching and the meditation. Um, this person noted, um, shared the, the logo from Sunshine Yoga as their, their primary resource for this. Um, others talked about going to nature, taking a daily walk, so kind of a mix of that and physical activity, and really just kind of immersing themselves in, in the beauty of the natural surroundings. Um, this person noting that being outside makes me feel better, it makes me forget about my bladder, I can just go out and breathe fresh air, it allows me to be present, it doesn't judge me, it accepts me, allows me to face each and every day, um, giving hope, peace, and clarity. And many people shared images of natural surroundings. So um, these are just a, a few images uh, of nature and things that made people feel calm and centered and really present in the moment. Others talked about visual imagery and words. So this person talks about having motivational quotes around to give them strength, to help them face each day. Um, they shared kind of an, an image of some of the quotes that they have around, this last one being about acceptance. 
um, and noting that you know I still have troubles accepting my IC, but reading about it or seeing these affirmations allows them to get closer to acceptance um, and really provides important mental support during trying times. Others talked about what I, I feel like this dates me because I would call it letter writing, but you know these days it's it's email. But this person talked about taking the time to send an email out to their whole family and friends, and it was long, um, but taking just paragraphs of what it's like to live with IC, giving specific examples of how it could impact you, and really just kind of sharing their story, and that that was cathartic in some ways. Um, and also people talked a lot about information seeking and, and especially going online to really kind of understand other people's experiences with the condition, but also trying to find good reputable information about treatment strategies. Uh, another person talked about music as a self-care strategy. Um, so saying this is a tattoo that they have um, and the lyrics in the tattoo are don't sell yourself short, you might be bulletproof. Um, saying, I'm hopeful that my life with IC can also be a positive influence to others, that life can still be wonderful, magical, and strong, even with this condition. People also noted diet. Um, so for some, this was the most important thing, kind of figuring out what bothers you and then cutting them out of the diet or being careful or maybe taking a supplement like an acid reducer when eating them. Um, seasoning even specifically was noted, um, figuring out which seasonings, and I love this, that they discover the world of fresh herbs and they grew their own herb garden and, and noting that, hey, you know, even if I might not be able to have onion, I can have garlic and onion chives. Um, and nothing is better than fresh oregano or basil and salad. Um, and, this, and I think it's funny because I think some of you might be listening and saying, oh, but there's no way I could have garlic. And I think that illustrates how different it can be for different people. But just this idea of figuring out what works for you and making adjustments based on that. And some of the images, so people certainly shared images of things like, hey, I definitely couldn't eat that or that would really bother me. Um, or the resources. So this person took a picture of a food list that they use with their acid reducers and um, I believe that's peppermint, something that, that helps them. Um, others, I love this photo because it really represents um, not only the food aspect, so going for a picnic with, with friends and how everybody brought something and was cognizant of some of the restrictions because of IC, so making sure that the person with IC still had something to eat and they could still go out and have that enjoyment with others. So in looking at habits and routines, so I think the idea here is that even with the assistance of the healthcare community, this patient population um, really noted taking significant personal responsibility for care. And those strategies for self-care varied. Um, and you can see the list of them here um, with plenty others that, that came up. And that some of those self-care strategies, even though they were helpful, came with a cost. Um, both financial, as noted with the aloe vera, but also social. Um, people certainly talked about dietary restrictions as being challenging when wanting to be social with others. But importantly, most of these self-care strategies also came with a sense of personal power and control, that once people figured out what worked for them, they had a variety of things, a variety of tools in their toolkit that they could go to. So let's talk about the R in Thrive, relational and social factors. This was another big theme. And I want to start with physical intimacy um, related to sexual satisfaction um, because I think, and, and pain with sex, to be, to be more blunt, um, because I think this is something that just isn't probably talked about as much um, or should be talked about, I think, a, a bit more. And this was certainly noted as a challenge. Um, you know, folks, this person noting, I felt less than as a woman and as a wife. Like, I might not be able to do the things that you're supposed to do as a partner. And even though their partner was understanding, having those conversations was hard because it meant being vulnerable. And, you know, knowing that this has an impact on a relationship and this person saying, you know, that made me feel like I wasn't a good fiance, wife, woman, basically. Um, another person noting they're still trying to figure it out, um, not feeling like they're in the mood because certainly when you're having pain, it's almost like it disconnected me like emotionally with it. And so I think, you know, this was certainly an issue for folks um, and I think it needs to be noted as a challenge. Moving on to a variety of types of relationships that you can have. So online communities certainly came up um, and there was kind of a mix and it really was kind of dependent on the people in the groups and the types of groups. This person noting that actually going into these online communities for them made it feel worse because some of these people in the groups were really focused on the negative. And certainly this isn't to 
say that that's that people shouldn't be talking about the challenges of living with this condition but i think it's important to note that especially for someone who's just been diagnosed being immersed in that can be really hard um, so this person was noting like i'm not being uplifted here i'm just being told how terrible this is um, but others people other people noting like hey i am in particular groups and um, you know looking for positive and uplifting types of groups trying to associate themselves with more positive and uplifting people um, and that there are some real positives because especially you know not having people physically around you who have the condition that online world can be really important knowing that you're not the only person in the world going through it um, that they can they can talk about the challenges but also talk about what works since this person noted that so it gives me something to add to my toolbox um, not feeling alone um, um, even though people are really far away from me I can feel like okay if they made it through the day then I can make it through the day too. Certainly quite a bit of discussion about engagement with family and friends. Um, you know, some of the challenges of being around people, especially when you have to use the restroom repeatedly. So this person saying, you know, people around them saying, what, you have to go to the bathroom again? Um, you know, and noting that if you're so at someone's house and you're the one who's using the, the bathroom all the time that people note and kind of talking about some of the challenges between, you know, how much are you going to tell people? What are you going to share about why you're going to the bathroom so much? Um, even close family, you know, um, even though even though people don't necessarily judge, there was kind of this lack of understanding, like, oh, it's just a bladder infection. Um, and, and really this person expressing the frustration with that misunderstanding, like, you know, those are the people that you just want to punch, you know, um, because I was being judged or, you know, they kind of go down their own path of what they understand, even though it's not relevant. It can be really frustrating. But people also talked about how supportive family and friends could be too. So this person saying that their family is really very supportive when it comes to the diet, that they follow it too. I love this example of, you know, if they're trying to cheat um, and they get kind of, their family will say, hey, or do you really want to do that? They'll fuss at me. Um, I love this. My daughter worked at McDonald's for a while. I thought I could sneak through McDonald's and get a small one day and she came across. Um, I didn't know they had cameras and she's like, you're not supposed to have that, mom. Um, like saying, you know, oh man, I can't even cheat when I'm out. Um, but, you know, even as kind of funny as that example is, um, really having family and friends that were really encouraging and supportive. And noting that sometimes when you're not feeling well, you'd rather be alone. Um, and that can sometimes lead to cutting people off or withdrawing. But really, I love this, but more recently, I try to surround myself with people that don't let me do that. Um, having friends that will call me out and say, hey, I know what you're trying to do, um, but I'm coming over or answer the phone. Um, so having people that do a good job of drawing someone out of that withdrawal behavior. Uh, this person took a great photo that kind of represents this concept that sometimes people with IC don't really understand it. And so I feel like I'm in this box. Um, but they pick this particular box and this image because it does have latches and a combination. So that was representative of the fact that there, way, there is a way to open the box. Uh, a way to open up to the challenges of feeling closed off and disconnected. Um, also, people noted the support of specific friends and family with two legs and four. So um, a partner and a dog, Snoopy, um, and how supportive they've been, especially around those dietary restrictions um, and even being willing to eat a more limited diet, um, you know, and, and saying, you know, hey, my, you know, my husband refused to have me make two dishes, one for him, um, one for me and one without those foods that might be bothersome. Um, so, you know, noting that kind of support. Um, also, kind of, again, this, this getting around this concept of uh, being around people who draw you out. Um, so this is a picture of someone who went skydiving with their friend, um, noting that I found that I'm, I'm good at isolating, especially when I'm not feeling well. Um, so it's important to get out more, spend time with friends and do things that get me out of my comfort zone. Um, and I would certainly agree that skydiving is, is certainly that, at least for many of us. So when it comes to the, the, the relational and social factors, um, physical intimacy due to pain was definitely reported as a significant challenge for some. Um, these online communities can be incredibly helpful to connect people, especially when you don't have people around you physically who have the condition but their helpfulness is really dependent on their nature. Um, people noted choices that they made about who to open up to and how, um, especially around 
um, things like, you know, why do I have to use the bathroom so much? Or maybe why do I have these dietary restrictions? Uh, but that close family and friends can really play an important role in coping, um, especially when they're encouraging um, and they're helping someone continue to live their life. So the individual differences, a lot of this has to get, some of this is related to differences based on demographics, which this study did not explore because the sample size wasn't appropriate. But what I did know in the study were comments around kind of disposition or personality. And a number of people talked about having a positive disposition or outlook. And so there were a lot of, a lot of discussion about feeling hopeful. Um, this person noting that, you know, with all these people involved with IC, they come out and say, hey, I have IC. This is how it affects me and what I have to do, the changes I have to make, but you can do this too. Um, you know, if people are willing to do that, we can conquer IC. Another person noted feeling hope about, hey, I've been able to deal with this so far, and I've been able to do it in a positive way and find options and cope, so that makes me feel like hopeful that I can continue on like this. So it's a very positive outlook. Um, people shared photos that made them feel hope or feel positive, so um, art from their kids, um, getting out on the open road on the motorcycle uh, with their friends and family, um, and even some, some objects, things that, uh, well, and I'll talk about spirituality here in a little bit, things that um, make them feel empowered or connected um, and, and feel like they can engage in healing. Uh, another person talked about feeling positive, um, even recognizing the struggle but knowing that they have a support system, that they're in a place emotionally, spiritually, where they can live a good life with IC, and IC doesn't control me anymore. Uh, people noting feeling resilience, hope, confidence, um, that going through therapy and, and kind of dealing with some of the mental health challenges was really in, very impactful for them and helping them cope and feeling that they have perseverance and courage to get through it. Willingness to open and try new things, to keep searching, um, to engage in and let others kind of be a part of their healing process as a team effort. And, and, and being an eternal optimist. So, you know, I think people did know particular personal characteristics that they identified as being helpful to them. Again, that kind of positive disposition, but a whole host of other characteristics that you see listed here. So let's talk about values and beliefs. And this really kind of gets to um, spirituality, which is, it does include religion, but doesn't have to, um, as well as beliefs about the condition, including its role in one's life or your ability to control it. So this person here is talking about going on a spiritual journey to a particular place um, and engaging in kind of personal work, letting go of stuff that is unproductive and considered baggage, um, and really that having an impact on her, her whole outlook. Uh, another person noted their their Christian faith and how that has helped, um, you know, praying for God's blessing and, you know, knowing that this wasn't something that could be cured, but here she is over 10 years later and feeling really good 99% of the time and attributing um, some or a lot of that to, to her faith. Others also talked about acceptance, um, noting that living with this condition is a journey, that that journey will continue, but I factored in living with this condition pretty well and I don't let it get me down. Again, that positive attitude came up here too. I'm sure you're noting some kind of overlap in these things, um, but knowing, hey, I, I have to live with it. It's not going to go away, but I'm gonna enjoy the time that I have when it isn't as bad. Um, having places to go um, and it, having those happy places and, and knowing that like you can still have that. I see doesn't take that stuff away from you. You can still have enjoyment of these experiences. And here's that quote from earlier about acceptance, because again, you know, I think um, this was a, a big piece of what that was that person was talking about, about having those motivational quotes nearby, um, but that acceptance being really a, an important part of that. So, you know, again, with values and beliefs, you know, spirituality, including but not limited to religious faith, were really important, were reported to be um, to be calming, to be centering, and also helping to provide a sense of control, comfort, and joy. And that the acceptance of the, con the condition, not, not resignation, but really acceptance of it in, in one's life seemed to provide a sense of resilience and self-efficacy. Finally, we'll talk about emotional factors. Um, so certainly, as you can imagine, there were a range of emotions reported, um, both negative, traditionally negative and positive. Um, and I talked earlier about diagnosis, the sense of loss and grief. 
feeling like part of your identity was taken away at the time of diagnosis. You're still the same person, but you seem different. Um, having grief for your what you could have perceived to be your formal life pre-diagnosis. Um, this person gave an example of, um, as a church pianist and organist, um, the challenges of being able to complete a service because having to go to the restroom multiple times and you know longing for the days where you know they can get through a service without having to go run and have a break and how that really those types of things can challenge your identity um, especially when you look at the roles that you've had um, and how this condition can impact those certainly people noticed noted things like embarrassment so having to go to the bathroom and people wondering you know why you're doing that um, and going to a meeting, you know, and having to get up multiple times, um, you know, sometimes every 10 minutes for an hour, and then you get stressed about it and can actually make it worse. Although this person noting like, hey, I'm just going to tell you, I have a bladder disease. I'm not being rude, but it's acting up right now, and I'm going to be running to the restroom um, and really countering those initial feelings of embarrassment by just being upfront about it. Uh, this person also noting some embarrassment around those dietary restrictions when people, you know, taking you out to dinner, and you know, saying, you know, I, I really can't eat much of this, but you certainly, you still eat it. You get what you want. It won't bother me. Um, feeling a little bit of embarrassment there too. And frustration. Um, this person noted specifically around feeling like a drug seeker um, when dealing with the chronic pain. Um, but this person noticing, noting that um, they had been on pain medication, um, and that it really, it just allowed them to get out of bed and function. They're not a drug seeker. This was really something that they needed to help cope. Um, and other people noting frustration around not being able to get a good night's sleep. But as much as there were negative emotions expressed, there were also really positive ones too. And some of them we've already kind of talked about, but I just want to come back to the fact that there was a lot of gratitude and hope expressed. This was a really prominent theme. Um, this person noticing, noting um, having so much gratitude for their kids, um, particularly I think talking about their son, um, his presence, his kindness, his love, keeping them moving each and every day and, you know, being the best possible mother and, and saying, I am not my illness. I am a mother, a lover, a wife, a coworker, a friend, and this illness does not have me. Um, you know, recognizing the sun does rise again, even on challenging days, um, appreciating the beauty in life that gives them hope. Um, and this person noting, you know, I, I've kind of connecting their condition to previous emotional trauma, but knowing that there is healing through self-development and spiritual reflection and feeling hopeful about all the things that they have found to help them get through this and lead a healthy life. So of course, a range of emotions were reported, um, including an acknowledgement of experiencing negative emotional states of mind. That is normal when coping with a chronic condition, but knowing also that there's also a lot of hope and gratitude. Um, those were really prominent feelings expressed by all participants in the study. All right, so what does all this mean? So we've gotten through the THRIVE acronym. Um, so I would say, you know, much of what we found was very consistent with what we know about coping with chronic conditions in general. I see is, um, is not an outlier in that sense. Um, there are things that are just very similar. And, and what we found really supports the idea that there are both internal and external factors that influence how we cope and, and thus likely influ influence our outcomes with this condition. Um, and I think that what I found, I think very specifically supports what I noted as that thrive biopsychosocial approach. So I'm gonna come back to this image, but I wanna add to it um, the contextual factor of therapeutic interventions, which I don't know is as, as explicit in the original image. I do believe the biomedical approach is useful to an extent, especially when it comes to diagnosis, having positive support from providers, certain treatments may, may indeed be helpful. Um, but this condition is not all just about what your, your doctor or your healthcare provider is telling you to do. People who are, at least in our study, who are doing well, seem to be taking personally a biopsychosocial approach. They're very focused on the habits and routines that support effective self-management, although this does vary from individual to individual what specifically works. They're also paying close attention to relationships with others. Uh, for example, looking for more positive people in those online communities, focusing on spending time with friends and family who draw them out, or draw them out help them continue to help live their lives. And so I think what we found in the data is very much supportive um, of this particular type of approach. 
Of course, there are limitations in every study. There was so much data that I could not present to you, and I'm probably already over time. Um, so, you know, that's a limitation, at least in this presentation. I do want to note that qualitative studies like mine, they're meant to provide depth, but they're not meant to be generalized to the whole population. So this is not to say that every person who is doing well with IC are doing all of these things. I think that's important to note, but I think this provides a foundation for future research to explore that. Um, I will certainly note that as the primary researcher on the study, I've been living with IC for almost 25 years. Um, there's always the potential for bias, but that is part of the reason why I worked with a research team to collect and analyze the data to kind of check myself, um, having people who don't live with a condition also looking at the data. And I think there, there's definitely a limitation here too um, uh, around the sample, um, as you noted in the demographics, primarily middle-aged, female, white, fairly educated. Um, so again, it's hard to make conclusions about everyone because the, the sample itself was not incredibly diverse. Um, and certainly I will note here too that, you know, if anybody who's living with this condition, who's interested in exploring new self-care strategies or any kind of treatment for coping with the condition should certainly um, consult with their healthcare team before doing so. So briefly, plans for the future. Um, I do plan to submit this data for publication um, in a journal. Um, I do want to relate, I do want to investigate the relationships among some of the constructs and the outcomes identified. And what I mean by that is, for example, does the nature and quality of someone's relationships with others, does that have an impact on physical and mental health? Does disposition have an impact on, on physical and mental health? Um, so really kind of trying to look at the relationships and associations between those things. I'm also really interested in developing um, or doing conducting intervention studies. So developing programs that support patients in a way that uses the biopsychosocial approach, um, are those interventions or those programs, are they feasible? Um, do people like them? And importantly, do they impact outcomes in this population? So lots of references. And now I would be happy to take questions about the study. All right, so we will move into Q&A. Um, I, I've got a number of questions I've, I've seen that I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, I certainly, um, please know if I don't answer your question, I certainly don't mean to disregard any. Um, I'm, I'm gonna focus on questions that I know I'm, I'm competent to answer. Um, and uh, one thing I wanna note too, before I kind of jump into answering the, the questions that you, you've posed, I hope that you heard and saw something that resonated with you in some way. Um, if you're, especially if you're feeling alone, I, I hope that it makes you maybe feel just a little bit less alone because I know that there sometimes can be comfort in shared experience. And the other thing I also want to say is that I hope that even if in a small bit, you come away with some sense of hope, um, especially if perhaps the more traditional biomedical approach has not been or has been limited perhaps in its ability to help you. Um, I think it's, it, it's important to know that there are other factors that can affect our outcomes, hence this focus on the biopsychosocial approach. Um, but the flip side of that too, is I wanna make really clear that even though there are things that we can do, actionable things that we can do, um, it doesn't mean that all the burden should be on you personally or that there's any blame on individuals for this condition. So I wanna be, I wanna be really clear about that. So let me jump into a, some of the questions that I feel like I can answer. Um, someone did pose what percentage of people with IC um, are, are thought to have Hunter's ulcers. I know in the literature, there's kind of a range of between five to 10%. Um, so so that's, that's what I know about that particular topic. Um, someone did ask also um, how those nine participants were selected for the qualitative phase of the study. So we had that, you know, over 500 people who completed the survey. And what we did is we, again, we looked at those physical and mental health scores, looking specifically for folks who had average to above average physical and mental health as compared to the general population um, and sent, sent invites to, for, to them to participate. Um, certainly we sent way more invites than we, than we got participants. Um, so not everybody who was invited chose to participate. Um, but a sample of nine is pretty common for um, a small qualitative study like this one. Um, and the other thing that we also tried to do is to invite people from who had a diverse background or a diverse set of demographics, trying to get people who identified 
um, you know, different genders, different race. Um, we were more successful in some places um, and not so much in others, as you might have noted by the, uh, the lack of diversity in the sample, but we, we did try. Uh, I saw someone had a question about, can IC impact sleep? And I, I do think that is something that is demonstrated in the literature. Um, certainly have seen um, a number of studies that have addressed um, IC and quality of life, either quantitatively or qualitatively. Um, and sleep has certainly been something that's been noted to be a challenge for folks with this condition. So um, even just thinking about if you've got urinary urgency and frequency, so having to get up in the middle of the night frequently, um, and also if you have pain, either before, during, or after urination, um, that can be something that can be disruptive to sleep as well. So that is something that's seen in the literature. Um, I saw there was a question about, um, and again, I'm gonna answer this briefly because this is about the extent of my knowledge on the, on the question, but someone asked about the use of Elmeron in bladder installations. Um, in my review of the literature, I have seen um, at least, I know of at least one small study um, that looked at that, although again, it's one study. So one study doesn't really, it's challenging to make broad generalizations after one study. So I would say, based on what I know about that, the results are, are inconclusive, but I know people have looked at it, but it would take me going back to the literature to really answer that more thoroughly. Uh, I also noted a question about how people defined flare-ups and that did come up in the study. Um, we had people who mentioned occasionally experiencing exacerbation of symptoms and generally how people talked about that was, I, you know, my, the severity of my symptoms were more noticeable or they were more disruptive to my daily life. So if it was urinary urgency and frequency, it was more, you know, hey, I'm, I'm experiencing, I'm, it's disrupting my ability to get things done because I have to get up and go to the bathroom um, or maybe feeling a bit distra distracted by an increase in pain. So that did, that did certainly come up um, in the study. I think we have a, another minute or so, so let me go back to the, the chat here um, and certainly Lee jump in if you're seeing any um, themes in the, the questions that you think I should address, um, point me in that direction too. Um, a lot of people sharing their, um, their experiences, uh, which I, I so appreciate. Um, yeah, so did anyone mention having frustration from trying to decide if treatments were causing more harm than good? And I think that's, that was something that came up in some individual stories. Some participants did talk about how um, there were times where, you know, you would try a, a, a treatment, especially something that might be more invasive and having that actually not be as beneficial um, as something that might be less invasive. Um, so that did, um, that was certainly part of the data that I saw. Um, yeah, and and I do, I appreciate this comment here, um, the individual saying, you know, I appreciate the emphasis on hope and optimism, but wish you'd talk more about grief and loss. And I, I that is a point well taken. It, it really is. I, I, as much as hope and optimism was a prominent theme, um, there was also a lot of discussion about that sense of loss, especially around the time of diagnosis um, and really it taking some time to figure out what that means uh, I think another theme that, you know, that certainly came out is that this is a journey and there are plenty of ups and downs. Um, and there are times where you're feeling better and you have things figured out and there are times where you don't and that's okay. That is normal. Um, so I, I, I really do um, very much appreciate that, that point. That's uh, well taken. Yes. Lee, did you see anything else that, I think we're about I a minute. No, I think you've done a good job of covering. There's just been a lot of support for the session and thanking you for, for the great presentation. Um, I did see someone that's going to be attending your university next year and majoring in public health. Uh, Excellent. So excited to, I think, meet you in person possibly. Um, but yeah, no, I, I didn't see anything else that I think that you would be able to answer. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you attending and um, listening to the results of the study. Um, and you can find my contact information through the University of Indianapolis if you'd like to reach out. I am always more than happy to answer questions and be of help if I can. So um, Lee, I'll turn things back over to you. Thank you so much, Laura Santuri. Um, so you guys have probably heard of Laura. She has is such a wonderful board member who is very active with the ICAM. She recently completed an ultra uh, marathon uh, fundraiser for ICA and we, we really 
shared a lot about that. So um, just really, really grateful to have your expertise and sharing your knowledge um, with, with us today. And we're really grateful to all of you who were able to join us and, and learn. Um, I think there was a question um, about whether or not there would be a recording available and, and you, you should be receiving something from Zoom um, after we stop today's uh, webinar. So you, you will have access to this as well. So thank you again for everyone uh, for joining us today and thank you, Laura. You're very Goodbye. welcome.